coming along and you're very welcome to speak. Well, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to uh, take a bit of a different tag and really talk about what we've been doing for the last five years with Transition, which I like to think of as, as a really big experiment. It's a very simple idea, simple set of tools, simple set of principles that we've put out there and people in all kinds of places have been trying them out. So I want to really give you a flavour of what that is and what we've been learning from that. And increasingly, particularly for the new book, we start to think of uh, Transition as being like a, a collection of ingredients. So rather than being like a, a model which says, first you do this, then you do this, and then you do that, and you can't think about doing that until you've done that and that. It's really uh, a, based on the idea of self-organisation, and the idea that people come together, decide they want to do something, and then transition looks different in every place where it emerges. But what we've seen over the last five years or so, is, is things that are emerging which, which we like to think of as being ingredients. So when you go into your larder and you decide that you want to start, uh, cooking, we've got those things there that are available. And what we see, each of those is a problem that we see emerge where groups are doing this, and then a solution that we've seen repeated enough times to have some kind of level of confidence that, that that's something that, that can be replicated. But every place assembles those uh, in a very different way. But what I want to do is to take you through what transition groups are doing so you can get a taste of what that actually looks like on the ground. So transition, just to, in, in, uh, in a graph crash course in what it's all about, uh, it's a bottom-up uh, res uh, response to peak oil and climate change. Uh, and it argues that um, well, what you have to do with those things is, is look at them at the same time. If you just look at climate change on its own, you don't look at the peak oil, then the solutions you come up with uh, are, aren't much use when you get into a very energy-constrained world with very volatile oil prices. Same time, if you just focus on peak oil and you think, my God, I have a liquid fuels problem, we have to get liquid fuels from wherever we can, then from a climate perspective, that's really so this bit in the middle is the all-important bit where you need to plan proactively, intentionally for that uh, transition. It's about powering down in terms of reducing energy consumption. But also we would argue this, this idea of localization, which I'll talk about a bit more in a minute. Uh, and then also powering up in terms of putting in place a new renewable energy infrastructure. And to that, more recently, of course, has been added the economic situation. Mervyn King said the other day, it's not like an ordinary recession where you lose output and get it back quickly. You may not get it back for many years. And that is a big, long-run loss on living standards for all people in this country. Now, I think what we're looking at as well is, uh, is, is the sort of unravelling of the debt bubble and more of a sort of economic contraction. So, so um, these two ideas of localization and resilience are really the two things that I hope you might take away from this, from this talk. So the idea of localization isn't the idea that you put a big fence up around places and don't let anything in or out. It's really the idea that, as Pete North from Liverpool University says, once you pass peak oil, really globalization starts to go into reverse. Uh, and uh, this is a picture of Totnes, where I've come from today in the 1930s. Uh, I just finished, uh, as was said there, a, a PhD at Plymouth University, and part of that was doing a lot of oral history around, around the town in the 30s and 40s. One of the things that's very distinctive is this whole area in the middle of the town here uh, was all food production, glass houses, food production tied into three shops on the main street. We talk these days about food miles. There was a system of food feet that we had in place until 1980. It's not to say that actually the 1940s were somehow this sort of resilient sort of nirvana, and there were plenty of things about it that were way, way less resilient than today, but there are some things that we can look to and find that are, that are useful. And David Fleming, the economist who died last year, used to say localization stands at best at the limits of practical uh, possibility, but it has a decisive argument in its favor that there will be no alternative. <laughs> <laughs> and resilience is really the idea about, about how you encounter shock from the outside and the, the, the ability to weather that, what the Crystal Palace manager Ian Dow used to call bounce back ability. Uh, and, uh, and so for us, it's really seeing that process of putting back in place an infrastructure that play, makes places more resilient has an enormous opportunity for places. This idea of localization as economic development, that one of the key places where, where the livelihoods and and so on, the training of the next 15, 20 years is going to come from, is by starting to plug the leaks uh, in our local economies. So transition as it's emerged has different facets to it really. Uh, it's an inner process, it's not just about nuts and bolts and solar panels and carrots, it's also a process which is I think very much about learning to support each other as communities through, through times of increasing uh, uncertainty. 
Uh, it's also about leading by practical example, about showing what's possible and not waiting for permission for anybody just to get on with it. It's an approach which is rooted in place and circumstance. Every way you go and you see transition, projects happening, they, they look distinctly different. They have their own quality, they emerge from what's around them. It's a tool for turning problems into solutions, starting to look at how we can take what we have and make something different out of that. It's a cultural shift. I think when we started doing transition, I thought of it as an environmental process. And now, five years later, of having seen it in lots of places, it's really about culture. And how do you shift the culture to be ready for times of, of increasing uncertainty and volatility in that way? Uh, and as part of that as well, uh, well, it's an economic process, which I'll talk about in a bit more in a minute. But it's also about storytelling. And it's one of the things that I notice in, in, in the transition group I'm most involved in is it starts to change the story that the place tells about itself. And I'll come back to that when we come on to that section. So what I want to do is just to give you a taste of what's actually happening. I'm not going to give you lots of theory about transition as an idea, or it's rooting different kind of models and concepts. I really want to give you a taste of what people are actually doing once they've picked up this simple set of tools and actually decided they're going to get on with it. Uh, and illustrating that with some of the ingredients that we talk about in the new book. So the first one, coming together as groups, People form around this idea, they want to get on with it. But one of the key things is that actually we're not really that used these days to forming groups with other people. Uh, we've become so sort of uh, fragmented and, and, and individualised. And actually the, the assumption that everybody can just form, form fantastic groups where after six months we don't all want to murder each other or take each other to court. It's something that needs some work and needs some tools. So in the training that we provide, uh, and we really stress that thing that people need to learn how to actually hold these groups together, because it's not just something, if you go, it's just about doing stuff, we're just going to do stuff, actually you do need more to it than that to hold it together. Uh, these kind of brainstorming tools like Open Space, World Cafe, these ways of bringing people together in such a way that their ideas drive and inform the process. Uh, if, you've, if you've ever been around an you know, Open Space, fantastic. If you're a control freak, it's terrifying, but it always works. And one of the things in the research I did was, was using open space as a, as a research methodology, which was really interesting, in terms of seeing how uh, in the first open spaces that we run in Transition Time Top Ness, the ideas, the projects that people came up with, actually when you came back to those things four years later, how many of those things had actually happened and were now actually happening on the ground? Uh, they're, they're very interesting mechanisms. A whole question of inclusion and diversity, uh, and how you work and how you do this in communities that are very, very uh, diverse and different levels of income and so on. Uh, Transition Time Tooting last summer uh, ran the Trash Catchers Carnival, which brought together a thousand uh, people, uh, local schools, mosques, temples, 8,000 people came out to see it. It was the first transition project to be funded by the Arts Council. And uh, one of the key things that came out of it at the end was people said, if we can do that, we can do anything. Uh, and I think that's really the spirit that, that we're trying to foster. And creating visions and telling stories about, about what this is going to be like. I always think one of the big, big challenges with the whole thing about a post-carbon world, we talk about uh, cut, cutting emissions by 80% by 2050, uh, which actually is, there's a typical center point out something I read recently, is about the carbon emissions of Mozambique today. I, mean, I think actually there's a huge gulf in terms of well, what's that actually going to be like? What's that going to look like and smell like and feel like? And I asked our senior planner, well, describe that world to me. What would it be like? He said, you know, I've never thought of that before. Yeah. I thought, isn't that interesting? That's your job to actually make that happen. Uh, but actually, if you can't, if you don't have an idea of what it's going to be like, why would you get out of bed in the morning to put your shoulder to making that happen? So part of what transition groups do is really finding different ways to, to try and tell that story and then to backcast and tell the story about how we got there. This is one of the transition groups in Japan doing that. Working with councils. Uh, it's happening all over the country as well in very really interesting ways. In, in Taunton, Transition Taunton, they did a, a, a work with the local council there where all 375 people from the local council came together for a number of sessions to look at and create a vision for the area uh, as a more resilient uh, community. You can find that report online. It's really sort of fed into the, uh, the, the lifeblood of, of the council. And uh, I'm, I think I'm only speaking as more props today. Uh, so one of my props is this really horrible jumper from Taunton that they sent me. And this was because uh, they, the, the council did a day which was called Turn the Heat Down Day, where everybody was told to come, they were going to turn the heating down, everybody was to come into work wearing a jumper, and there were prizes given for the most horrible jumpers people wore to work, and this was one of them. <laughs> 
so what, also what we're seeing is, is those very practical things that people just get started with actually doing things. Uh, and also the transition groups tend to work almost like little R&D units. They try things out, they work like the garden share scheme that Alexia was talking about earlier on today. Uh, that these ideas start and then they replicate very quickly out. So this is in bell size, this is draft busters which, which was got driven along by a transition bell size and now is being done by lots of other transition groups in London. Very simple model to pick up and then replicate. Uh, in Malvern, uh, this is the energy group from Transition Malvern. Uh, in, in Malvern they have 109 old Victorian gas lamps. They're the things that inspired C.S. Lewis when he wrote the lamp in which in the wardrobe, the gas lamp Lucy sees when she first goes through the door, is based on the ones in Malvern. They're all listed, they cost the council a fortune to maintain, they don't actually make very much light, they cost a fortune, about £130 worth of gas every year, £450 a year each to maintain, and the Transition Malvern Energy Group said, well we can do better than that. They've made over all these lamps, cutting their carbon emissions by 84%, making them 10 times brighter, and they're now planning an anaerobic digestion scheme that would then power these lights. Uh, with that. <coughs> This idea of unleashings, transition groups have what they call unleashings quite often, which are the sort of a launch event. They're designed, we always say they're, they're the event that in 10 years' time people will put a blue plaque up to outside the building as the moment when this process, which had such an impact, started. This was last Christmas, the first transition uh, unleashing uh, in Brazil in one of the favelas in Sao Paulo, uh, which was an extraordinary event that brought the, the, the community together to, to, to celebrate that. Uh, local food, uh, again as Alexia was saying uh, this morning, a lot of groups start out around food. It seems to be the thing where you can start to make a visible difference very quickly. So this is in Tooting again, they have a thing called the food aval. Uh, in Tooting there's, there's lots of people where almost the entire diet is imported from the Indian subcontinent. You can go into shops on the high street there where the whole idea of local food seems, seems completely uh, Lost really. So they, they, run a, they run this festival where all the growers on the allotments bring all their spare produce down and then the different chefs from the different restaurants cook it in their different, uh, uh, in, in their different ways and people come and celebrate that. Again with local food, this is in Forest in Scotland, the whole thing of communities getting access for the land to start setting up, start putting back in place some of that local food infrastructure. This is in Forest, they about two acres. Uh, and rather than the traditional allotments, which are divided up into rectangles, theirs are divided up into interlocking circles. Mm -hmm. uh, getting hold of land as well is, is, is important in terms of being able to do that. So here this is in Dorchester, where they're setting up uh, a community farm. It's a local comedy club. We have the fundraiser giving them a very large cheque on top of a 2CB for some reason. Uh, and that, that, that's now moving forward as well. So this thing is starting to put in place that kind of uh, infrastructure is really important. And working with schools, uh, lots of transition groups start to build very productive relationships with the local schools. This is in Newent in the Forest of Dean where the transition group put up a big polytunnel for the school and were involved in the teaching of, of growing and had a GCSE in Environment and Land-Based Studies, which the school has found and there's this idea, well, if you take kids out of class, then their performance is going to go down. Uh, if, if you take them out of class and get them doing something useful, what they find is that every student who's, who's been doing this GCSE and has been out there learning to all their other results across the board have gone up to the extent that the school has actually funded somebody full time now to run this course. And the thing that was interesting when, when we started doing the new book was that the idea was, well, what we really want to be seeing is transition groups started to move towards creating social enterprises around this stuff, transition enterprises which uh, are about starting to make this all will happen on the ground in a way that's not grant dependent and which is viable. And actually when we started looking around, actually there were loads of these things already starting to happen just within that short period of time. So in Kingston, upon Thames, transition town Kingston, there's this uh, food co-op called From the Ground Up which has emerged, which is eventually a box scheme for the area. Uh, in Marsden and Slathwaite in Yorkshire, uh, the transition group there uh, took over the local shop, grocer shop that had closed down. And, uh, and reopened it as a community shop. They had about five weeks to sort it out. They raised £15,000 in shares in about three weeks in order to make it possible. One of the things that they did was when they took over their own grocers, they found that actually as a grocer, all the garlic that you can buy comes from China. And they thought, this is stupid. We actually grow quite good garlic. Right here. So they started the Marsden and Slashway Garlic Challenge, where everybody who came into the shop got given a clove of garlic and said, we'll buy all the garlic you can grow. But the idea is at least to be self-sufficient in garlic. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the businesses that, that, that 
work from there is the Handmade Bakery, who are a fantastic model of how to get young people back into business without having to get enormously in debt with, with the banks. The young couple who wanted to set up a bakery, very inspired by Andrew Whitley's Real Bread campaign. Uh, they didn't have any money, so they started as a subscription-based bakery where people bought shares in the bakery. Uh, and then what it meant was that three years later, when the business was going so well, they wanted to expand into new premises, needed to borrow £30,000 from the bank, who were going to charge them 7% interest. Uh, they actually went back to all their subscribers and said, please lend us £30,000, we'll pay you 7% interest in bread. <laughs> Which cost them 2%. Ooh, <laughs> So in Devon, uh, Transition Topsham started up and they, uh, uh, they found, they, they, they did awareness raising, they showed films and so on. They, you know, after a year they said, what is the one thing that really brings people together? This time? Is it peak oil? Is it climate change? Is it beer? I think it may well be. And again, they raised £40,000 in a share option within a few weeks. Uh, about 55 members who, who run the brewery. Uh, and uh, these kind of things are, are really, really important, I think. really powerful. Prop. Prop. Prop, I know you would come to that. Uh, but... <laughs> 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 prompter, it's my prompter. It's my prompter. It's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> so this whole idea about, as well about, about uh, part of localisation is about this idea of how, how do you make money circulate as many times locally as possible? How do you, New Economics Foundation refer to it? Plug the leaks, as it so, it's a different local currency schemes. This is the Brixton pound, uh, there's the Stroud pound, Thomas pound, various ones of those. Uh, the, the new iteration of that is the, is the Bristol pound and the Lambeth pound, which are going to be mobile phone based alternative currencies, which will be coming out later near, near the end of this year. Exploring different ways that you can get money to cycle locally as many times as possible. Now comes the problem. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is something that's, that's happened in, uh, very, very recently, which I think is fantastic. So in Lewis, which is one of the first transition town projects, they, uh, they worked with the local brewery, Harvey's. <coughs> and the Harvey's was a very big roof, and they decided they wanted to set up the UK's first community solar power station. Uh, and uh, the, the local brewery brewed this beer called Sunshine Ale in order to celebrate it. When they launched the Lewis Pound, they did another beer called Quids Inn. <laughs> the idea, there's something about the idea of local breweries that celebrate the process of the community transitioning itself in the beers that they produce that just fills me with, with delight. Uh, so they, uh, they, have, they are going to put 554 PV panels on the roof of the brewery. They needed to raise £310,000 uh, in five weeks with a community share option, which they did. Uh, and uh, that's a fantastic project. But where this all starts to go, you know, it starts out with people getting together with friends and neighbours and starting growing stuff and starting thinking about local currencies, that's something the other. Where I kind of imagine all of this going, and so we start to see it going, is that it's about thinking strategically, as I said at the beginning, about this process of localisation. So uh, this is in Norwich, uh, Transition Norwich, together with uh, um, what they call East Anglia Food Link, uh, did a study called Can Norwich Feed Itself? They looked at the city of Norwich, all the land around it, how it's currently grown, what could be grown on that land. They concluded Norwich could feed itself uh, with a certain radius around, this, around the city, but they needed a new infrastructure in place. There were certain key things. They needed a new mill, they needed new community farms, they needed more research in terms of oats and beans and other crops that could be grown. So this is Transition Norwich, who then got some funding to do that, having identified those first steps. Uh, and there is now a mill getting put in place. This is now one of the sites where they're setting up a new community farm. There's other ones going in place. So it's not just about randomly sort of doing things in a sort of great enthusiastic whoosh. It's actually about starting to think strategically about how all of this hangs together. And this, and again, putting local infrastructure in place. This is in Edinburgh, a uh, transition town called to Bello, who needed to, uh, thought that the place didn't have a, a good market. They've put in place a new market. But I think actually when you start looking at the opportunities for that kind of infrastructure, there's enormous opportunities. When you start looking at plugging the leaks, every place where there's money pouring out of the bucket of our local economy is a potential livelihood, a potential local training, a potential local business for somebody. So I want to just talk a little bit about Totnes, which is as a case study. Uh, and, um, and it's the one that I studied in, in the research that I did. So we started out there five years ago. 
doing projects like this. This is a project we do called Top Nest and Nut Tree Capital of Britain. Uh, it was called the Nut Capital of Britain, but I've uh, <laughs> sort of taken us right by this stage. Uh, and this is about planting hybrid nut trees throughout the town. You can grow as much protein and carbohydrate per hectare with, uh, with uh, hybrid walnuts as you can with organically grown meat. So we've planted nearly 200 now throughout the town and people look after them. And, uh, this is a local solicitor. Every time someone writes a will with his company, he pays for a tree. This man has just set up a will, so they're planting his, his, his uh, hybrid walnut tree in town. Uh, there's the garden share which, which was talked about earlier on as well, so this is basically a dating agency that matches up people who want to grow food with people who don't have a, so people who have a garden they're too elderly and too busy to use, with people who want to grow food and don't have any way to grow. Very, very simple, doesn't take much time to run, we've never had anyone fall out or uh, go wrong. There's about 40 families now growing food who weren't able to do so and it just gets you past that whole uh, allotment waiting list side of things and builds really nice kind of social capital. One of the biggest projects we've done was Transition Streets. We, got, we were one of uh, the Department of Energy and Climate Change's low carbon communities uh, in 2008. And that enabled us to, do, us to do Transition Streets. And that's looking at behaviour change on a kind of street by street level. What does it look like if behaviour change comes from the bottom up with people getting together with the people around them? So there are now, sort of, it goes through three stages. First of all, they meet in groups uh, with their neighbours, eight to ten households. They work through a book that we've done. Uh, like a, so they meet seven times, one week they look at energy, then they look at water, and then they gather a lot of data that, that, that means that we can really see what the impact is. So there are now 500 households that have, that, that have gone through this scheme. On average they cut their carbon by about one and a half tons each, uh, and then they get the grants from the local council for the insulation that they may not have done, and then there are grants for installing solar PV as we've been on, on the whole of the town. But what's been fantastic about it is actually when I meet people in the town who've done it, they don't say, it's fantastic, we did Transition Street, we've just saved one and a half tons of carbon, £800 a year or whatever. What they say is, it's great, we now know so-and-so over the road, and, and us and so-and-so over there, we're now doing this together. So actually the social side of it has been way more, uh, way more impactful on people. And it's really interesting to see what it looks like when it comes uh, in that direction. One of the things that, uh, that, that I think is an enormous problem is still the fact that when our councils plan for our future, they do so based on assumptions that are, that are just completely inappropriate. You know, the idea that in 10 years' time we'll have more cheap energy than today, more economic growth than today, this whole thing. Well, when, when we get back to growth again, everything will be alright. That's what we're planning for, planning for the, getting back to the getting back to What if that's not the case? And what if we actually plan as a community for the intentional localisation? Uh, of the place that we live. So we did a project around for about a year and a half that was a kind of community visioning storytelling program uh, which, was, which you can find there uh, and um, that really started to set out the, 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 the steps that we saw. I had a study in called Cantonist Feed itself, had a Cantonist Power itself really looking at the energy potential of the area as well. And from that we identified a number of projects that we think of as the catalyst projects. How do you actually take this idea of localization as economic development and actually ground it uh, in, in the community in something which is viable. And so some of those projects are now moving forward. This is Transition Homes, which is going to be building affordable uh, housing for people on the housing list, but using predominantly local materials. Saying that actually every time we build, we should be using that opportunity to try and support the emerging new businesses in terms of materials. In Evervale in Wales, they've just built two local passive houses, houses that reach a passive house standard but use 80 or 90 percent local materials to actually build them, which is a really exciting thing. We set up our own energy company, the Top National Renewable Energy Society, and only 400 people in the town now have shares in that, and its plan is to put. Um, two wind turbines on, on, on the edge of Tottenham. So these kind of models whereby communities can invest into themselves in ways that they then own and manage that project in the long run are really, really important, I think. Uh, and the one that we're really focused on at the moment is any of you who have been to Tartanus will know that you get off the train and you're met with a, a sort of rather grotty looking, falling to bits old industrial plant, which used to be a milk processing plant, had a listed building on it, built, built, built by Isabel King and Brunel. Uh, and actually we want to get that site and develop it like Coin Street as something which is done and managed by the community. And we have a meeting in a week where we're hoping to emerge. We're working with Bioregional Quintain and looking to do something really, really interesting on that site. So uh, keep your fingers crossed for us next Monday afternoon. Uh, and actually what I wanted to, to, to close with was just two things that are really quite silly. But then we've had a long day looking at lots of graphs 
<laughs> so uh, one of the things that's in the Transition Companion is some newspaper articles from the future. Uh, this whole thing, as I was saying before, you know, well, what would it smell like and feel like and sound like if we actually woke up in that world? And uh, so one of the things that we do in various places is try and tell some of those stories. What would the, be the newspaper article stories from the future? So this, uh, there's just two, but this, this one is about uh, Cheryl Tweedy, I think she's called it. Uh, and her husband, then living in LA, who just separated because due to gardening differences. <laughs> uh, they met at a show called Strictly Come Mulching, and, uh, <laughs> and the idea of the program was that they were going to make over their, their, their ranch into a vegetable garden. But they, they reached a, an impasse where actually uh, uh, um, she was, uh, she, he was determined to grow everything very straight and, and, uh, uh, and have flowers everywhere and do, and do things very curvaceously, and she was determined that actually she just wanted to grow veg in straight rows, very traditional allotment kind of style of thing, and they just couldn't cope with it. It led, it led to them separating. Uh, and then this other one uh, is uh, from. <laughs> this is, this is a, a story from Bath in about 2020 uh, called Midnight Aquaculture Revelers Infuriate Local Brewer. <laughs> Lansdowne Road uh, was, one of ten of, uh, was one of ten of Bath's hilliest streets, which five years ago were pedestrianised and redeveloped into terraced, terraced fish ponds and food production beds. Visitors to the city are invited to help themselves to silence, but not the fish. And the hanging gardens of Bath Avon, as they've become dubbed, have become a major tourist attraction. Residents alongside the gardens take turns in tending the ponds and the beds, and in spite of initial resistance and concerns about infestations of slugs lowering house prices, the scheme has been a huge hit. So last year, our publican here decided to try something new where he used the spent hops from his brewery to make biogas to heat one of these ponds. So that he could, uh, so that he could uh, experiment in, in trialing rice crops and water chestnuts. <laughs> but last Saturday night, however, he had a shock. I came out of the pub after closing time and said, "There, in my heated pools, were about 15 people in various states of undress, <laughs> carrying on and having a party as they were in, as though they were in a jacuzzi." <laughs> I gave them peace of my mind. I, I told them this is a groundbreaking urban aquaculture research project, not a bloody 18 to 30s holiday. I sent them packing with a flea in the area. The pools are now fenced off while John decides what to do next, although he did tell the Bath Chronicle that he was considering to breed crayfish, something with a nasty bite. <laughs> so, um, so if you're interested in, in, in anything else about transition, you want to find out anything else, transitionnetwork.org, you can search by initiatives in terms of is the, is the place you live already doing this, uh, rather than recreating the wheel. You can also search it by uh, uh, projects, all the projects that are underway, and also by the individuals who are involved. And I do a blog called, uh, called Transition Culture. Um, and Transition Companion, out of September, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Of the spirit of the local Agenda 21 in that sense, but I think it's more 
uh, as, as I remember local Agenda 21 when I lived in Bristol in the 90s, it was, it was a kind of a, a sort of a top down thing trying to pretend it wasn't. It was kind of my perception of it at the time. And, uh, and, and uh, which may be unfair, but actually, my sense of what transition is trying to do is to is, is that it actually waits until it has a genuine sense that there's a buzz around it and there's stuff going on before it starts to build a relationship with the council. Certainly, some transition projects have, have gone to the council just after the right before we're now a transition. Whatever, let's go and talk to the council, and the council say, "Well, who? What? You never heard of it." And, and, and actually, if you go along, and once you've got some momentum, oh, you're the people who did that. It makes a big difference in terms of how that how that works. Uh, in terms of the wind project, uh, I think there is just starting to be opposition to it now. Uh, there's a group set up which is which is looking to do that, but actually, uh, and we'll see. There's also a, there's also an organisation forming in favour of it. So <laughs> the clubs are you know so that, that's all starting because there'll be a planning application going in quite soon on this, and everybody's starting to jostle for, for position on it. But I think you know with 400. Uh, members of the community and, uh, and I think certainly as I was saying about how the whole process has really started to change the way the place thinks about itself and the way that other people think about it. The council just published this development plan document which took four years to produce and in this little box at the beginning of things about the town, one of them is it's a transition town, uh, a home of the transition movement. So uh, <coughs> that idea is starting to seep into all kinds of places which is in terms of resilience, absolutely. I think it's always that question of resilient to what, and there's a and there's a whole area of resilience which is very sort of, which is understandably very fear based and sort of well, you know, and, and I think what I think what we try and argue is always for a sort of resilience, a, a different version of resilience, and uh, but if what you're talking about is resilience to people on climate change and economic instability and or contraction, then a lot of the things that you need to do to build that resilience. Are actually hugely positive for the place, and uh, the idea that actually resilience is just about sort of pandemics and uh, and, and so on. Um, I mean, it's been really fascinating. I think over the five years since we started the transition, I don't in any way link it all to to, to all, but actually how that term resilience has started to pop up in all kinds of places that it really wasn't, and also how people are starting to take that different take of what it might be. You know, yes, it could just be about uh, making sure you've got enough body bags and that you know where you're going to put everything. But actually, there's a, there's a different take on it, and I think it's a really, really useful concept for that. You know. uh, and, and it adds in a different aspect of you know, sustainability, is, is a very, very useful uh, way of looking at things. But sustainability doesn't tend to have in it that sense of well, how ready are you for things that just come out of nowhere, and how flexible are you. And I think when you put resilience and sustainability together, you have a very powerful um, set of things. One can imagine that some transition towns have started with a small group of enthusiasts. Is there any evidence for a contagion effect so that it actually becomes more infused throughout the whole community? And if so, how does this happen? Rather than wielding when everybody's all to the, uh, squaring up to each other. 
uh, uh, I, the temptation would be to say funding, but actually my experience is that, that certainly the first couple of years of doing transition projects, they, they generally ha happen without any funding. Uh, some, of, some of them are different, but actually I think that, uh, that you have an enormous amount of enthusiasm at, at that stage and you can't really buy that kind of, and I'd rather have that enthusiasm uh, than funding at that early stage. Uh, I think other factors for success would be uh, having, a, having a wide range of people, having people that come with a range of different skills, so you have some people who have experience of business, some people of activism, some people of community work, and you have a wide, you're not all the same kind of people in that way. Uh, and I think, I think as well it's, it's, it's your ability to, 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 to weave stories and, 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 and how, how you communicate the idea. And there's always a sort of a tension within transition about, well, to what extent is it around activism and to what extent is it not? Uh, and my sense is that one of the big powers of, of transition is it doesn't start out with a list of whose fault everything is. Mm. And it doesn't start out with a sort of, uh, uh, well, things are going to change when this happens and this happens. It just, just get on with it. And those, a lot of those things just start to kind of uh, fade away. It's really interesting in Tottenham, you know, we had we have a very, very conservative council, very conservative MP, who've been quite sort of... Uh, Standoffish and oh, there they go again, kind of what are they up to now, sort of thing. Uh, but actually, then they go away to conferences outside Thomas because say, oh, you're from Thomas, oh, transition town Thomas, oh, fantastic. So it sort of comes, it sort of comes the other way around. So, uh, uh, I think it's, it's, it's like a micro, it's like you kind of inoculate a place with it. It's like a mycorrhizal fungus and it runs and it just floats up in all kinds of unexpected places. The specific, the specific question I asked oh, about food was how many people can you feed from per hectare because you know, there's lots of different crops. Okay, uh, certainly the, the places that have done can wherever feed itself studies so far are Stroud, Norwich, uh, Totnes, and I think there was one in Wales somewhere. And they're all very different because Norwich can feed itself on less land because they can grow a lot of cereals and grains. Uh, but I think one of the main things that comes out of those studies is that when we talk about uh, food uh, resilience and a place becoming, you know, growing more local food, we tend to just fixate on vegetables. And so most kind of local food stuff is around allotments and gardens, and actually vegetables are less than 10% of our overall diet. You know, it's about thinking about the, the, the carbohydrates, the sugars, the fats, the cereals, all that kind of thing. Um, in terms of that, whether we can feed ourselves kind of stuff, I think there's a, we need a kind of a national thing. Simon Fairley did a, a very useful study called the Britain Feed Itself, which was an update of Kenneth Mellonby's one, which argued that we could, uh, eating a more seasonal diet. Uh, one of the questions that I've explored in the, the PhD that I did was about what percentage of, what ratio of local to imported might be possible. And certainly the, the Fife Diet in Scotland, in really looking at that on the ground, they argue that about 80-20, and when they say to people, how about trying 100% diet, they go, oh, I couldn't live without chocolate or red wine and banana. And they start listing off, you just start listing out the things that you couldn't live without. And actually, they're, they're always way less than 20%. And so the, the, the bulk of that could come. But I, it's, the thing with that is, well, why are we doing it? You know, actually, that's what DEF is there for, isn't it? <laughs> and, and here we are, sort of trying to, trying to work that stuff out. But actually, well, no, they won't. So it's down to us to do it. But, you know, it's, it's, it's gradually. And the other question is about contagion. Oh, contagion. Um, I think it's different in different places, and I think some, some projects find they have an initial big surge of, of enthusiasm, and then it sort of plateaus, and, and then they have to kind of work a bit harder. Um, and some places, uh, you kind of, I, I've, so the way transition works is you have lots of different working groups. So you have food, energy, building, and the people who are passionate about those things come along with their energy. And so certainly in the, the one I'm involved in, you know, you kind of think, of the, the house groups going very flat, nothing much seems to be happening, but then the food group will come, you know, they do sort of pulse different bits of it, pulse at different times. Uh, and we always try to sort of uh, run events or things that outreach into different places where, where we haven't gone to before. Um, I mean, it, it wouldn't be true to say that, you know, I mean, certainly the, 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 the research that I did said that 75% of people in the town had heard of it, 62% of people said they thought it was a good idea, they were kind of largely in agreement with its aims. About 30% have had some kind of interface, interaction with it. But I think sometimes, you know, like in terms of the tipping point, Malcolm Gladwell's tipping point, I think we're really on that tipping point. Mm -hmm. A number of big projects that need to just tip over and actually start running. And I think sometimes, you know, we focus on well, how do we reach the people who are kind of the, the sort of the, 
the, the unconverted, as it were. But I, and that, which is a really important, I think there are a whole different whole range of ways to do that. But also I think there's a really important bit which is about working with the people who are on board and who are converted, and giving them the right skills. Uh, because actually starting to take ideas, certainly a lot of people who are the converted, might have been used for a long time to be in community environmental groups and start a little project and start a little thing over here. But actually that step into thinking, right, how do we look at making this, uh, see this in the context of a revived local economy, and that kind of thing, takes takes some additional skills and support. And that's really important as well. Yeah. I think to cut the short, I'm trying to find so I'm afraid I'll put the questions for Rob there, but Rob, thank you very much.